folk music has an interesting past in American popular music. Um, in the terms of our discussion, we're going to think about folk music as it emerged uh, in the late 1950s uh, and into the 1960s as a kind of folk revival. Next week, when we talk about uh, the Beatles and the British Invasion, we'll, often we'll also talk about a style, a kind of folk revival they had in the UK, which we never really experienced here, called Skiffle. In fact, their folk revival happened a little earlier than our folk revival did. Theirs was already going uh, in 1957 with Lottie Donegan and the Rock Island Line. Here with us and the Kingston Trio and other uh, folks like that, uh, it isn't until 1958 or 1959 that we really get started. Now, in this country, folk music uh, had been certainly been popular before the late 50s when we have the folk revival. Um, but what we want to talk about here is how this folk, this folk revival constitutes one of the first splits in this new youth market that we're going to see. Remember that the idea is that during the 55 through 59 period, what, we, what was demonstrated was that there was a youth market at all. That is a market for youth records as opposed to basically just any kind of mainstream pop record. And you shouldn't expect that people like Frank Sinatra and some of the more traditional musicians weren't continuing to sell records while rock and roll was going on. I mean, rock and roll was one part of the market, but it wasn't the entire mainstream pop market. Anyway, that, that was the youth market was already a kind of a split away from the, the mainstream pop market. Now within the youth market, there's a split for the teenage kids, the high school kids, maybe the preteen kids, and the college age kids who used to be fans of Elvis Presley and now had moved on to college and were interested in putting their childish things behind them and impressing everybody with how uh, doggone serious they were. And, um, and folk music is in many ways one of the places that those folks went. Now, a lot of other college uh, kids got involved in the jazz, and they liked jazz a lot. Jazz, of course, was the music of the beat generation, beat poetry. Um, a lot of people got interested in classical music as well. Uh, but folk music was a kind of music that, um, you know, you could sort of, if you were a man, stroke your beard to and uh, sort of think about the importance of the lyrics and the kinds of things they were saying. It dealt with more serious issues and more sort of serious problems in the world than teenage love and romance and ideal boyfriends and this kind of thing. Uh, a kid goes off to college, wants to be taken seriously, uh, starts to read Nietzsche and grows a little beard and smokes a pipe and wears a sweater and all of a sudden wants to be taken seriously and folk music sort of really fit that uh, pretty well uh, for these kids. There's a, a real appeal to populism. The idea in folk music that, you know, we're sort of all in this together, we're all equals. Um, there's a real kind of non-commercial emphasis, although it turns out that folk music as a popular style is just as commercial as every other music when it comes to actually selling it. But the image is that it's not commercial. And it's often socially conscious, um, or even activist in a certain kind of way. Now, the roots of folk go back to the 40s um, and into the early 1950s. Um, with people like um, the Weavers, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, um, writing music that was really about social problems and a kind of an approach to uh, everybody sharing in things together. This land is your land. Uh, this land is my land. But uh, and, and some of those early songs are tunes like The Weaver's Good Night Irene, which was a number one hit on the pop charts in 1950, or On Top of Old Smokey, a number two hit in 1951. But with the rise of McCarthyism in this country and the um, s seeking out or trying to flesh, fl uh, flush out all the possible communist or communist sympathizers in the country, rightly or wrongly, whatever you may think about that, um, a lot of folk musicians uh, were, uh, were under scrutiny um, because they were seen as uh, communists or communist sympathizers. And that was sometimes true, actually. It wasn't always true of everybody, but it actually was true. I mean, some really did uh, believe in communism. Uh, it, but that tended to sort of put a damper on their ability to sell records to a mainstream pop audience. So there's a kind of a silence that happens in folk music um, at the, at the, into the 1950s. And when folk music starts to revive in the late 1950s, it really stays away 
from political issues. Um, the most important group in this part of this folk revival is a group out of San Francisco called the Kingston Trio. Um, they take their name, the Kingston Trio, uh, from this fascination we had for calypso music at about the same time, uh, Harry Belafonte singing, uh, singing tunes about uh, Jamaica Farewell or the Banana Boat song, the Deo song, that kind of thing. Um, and so Kingston was kind of, you know, kind of in the air and kind of a hip thing to do. So they were the Kingston Trio, even though their music had nothing to do with Calypso music or Jamaica. Uh, anyway, uh, their approach, three guys uh, singing and playing acoustic instruments, guitars and banjo, um, singing in harmony, producing very um, professional performances that never seemed really professional. They almost, they give, give the image of just three guys that could be anybody who picked up these instruments and they're just sort of singing and playing. But if you listen to the recording, you see that there's an awful lot of production, an awful lot of talent, and an awful lot of thought to the arrangement that goes into them. A good example is their big number one hit from 1959, Tom Dooley, which is a traditional song, uh, a 19th century song that deals with a murderer and this kind of thing, but it doesn't get into issues of, 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 uh, of civil rights or, or um, socioeconomic problems or issues or po politics or anything like that. It deals with these kinds of serious issues from a historical perspective, which is kind of safe to do at the time because, like I say, there had been a, a big scare with the McCarthyism thing. Um, the, the Kingston Trio were on Capitol Records out of Los Angeles, and in the period between 1959 and 1965 had 10 singles in the top 40. Uh, they were very, very big during this period. And when somebody thought of what is folk music in the period before uh, the arrival of Bob Dylan and Roger McGuinn and all these guys with folk rock in 1965, folk music probably meant um, either the Kingston Trio or a group we're going to talk about in just a minute, Peter, Paul, and Mary. It's important for us to realize that somebody like Bob Dylan didn't really have a professional performing career, even though he did records. He didn't really, wasn't really sort of a star as a performer until 1965. So folk music really meant the Kingston Trio uh, in, in many cases. They were very, very successful. Uh, other groups of note that are sort of similar to the Kingston Trio would be the Highwaymen, the Rooftop Singers, or perhaps most importantly, the New Christie Minstrels. All of these groups are very polished happy kind of folk sound that stayed way clear of any kind of controversy or political um, affiliation. Uh, if you're interested in the whole scene around that, there's a fantastic movie by Chris, Christopher Guest uh, called A Mighty Wind, which takes a kind of a satirical view of all this, but much of, like a lot of those Christopher Guest movies, much of what's in there is a pretty accurate representation of a lot of what went on, even if the characters themselves are, are, are sort of, you know, comedic and not, not accurate representations of anybody in particular. Um, well, let's talk about Peter, Paul, and Mary. Here's a group that really, like the Kingston Trio, were really at the top of this, of this folk revival, uh, formed in Greenwich Village in 1961. For a long time in the early 60s, Greenwich Village was the home of folk music, and so they came out of that Greenwich Village um, scene, uh, were put together uh, on purpose to have a vocal trio, um, and... Um, had a whole series of hits, If I Had a Hammer in 1962, Puff the Magic Dragon in 1962, and Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. Um, Bob Dylan, of course, nobody would have heard Dylan sing that song. Uh, the version they would have known would have been the Peter, Paul, and Mary tune. Um, and, of course, Dylan at the very beginning of his career was more a songwriter than a performer. So the point that I, I really want to drive home with regard to this folk revival is that while we think of people like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez as being important folkies um, during the 1960s, that really doesn't happen until the second half of the decade. The beginning of the decade, it's really about this sort of milder, more commercial form of folk music, which all the same is posing itself as not being very commercial, uh, characterized by groups like the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary. As far as Bob Dylan is concerned, um, uh, it, it's probably worth considering that during these years when these performances by these other groups like the Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary were so polished vocally and, um, and so arranged, somebody like Dylan with the voice of his and the harmonica playing and all that was thought of as really too amateurish for prime time. I mean, it was fine for coffee houses and for Greenwich Village and for people who are folk enthusiasts, but it just really wasn't polished enough to be part of the fo of, of folk music as it was understood in the first half of the decade. And so Dylan was largely relegated to being a very talented writer of songs that other people uh, performed. 
Now, as folk begins to unfold into the decade, into 1963, 1964, it's increasingly involved with the civil rights movement. In fact, the, the famous I Have a Dream speech that was done by Martin Luther King, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Dylan, uh, Joan Baez, all those people were there sort of locked, sort of holding arms uh, at, the, at the Lincoln Monument uh, when, they, when, when he did that speech. And so this, this return back to politics starts to make its way into folk music as the 60s unfold, first through the civil rights movement and then through the protest movement around the Vietnam War. And it isn't long before we get to 1967 and 1968 and folk music is right back to its sort of politically concerned, uh, the politically concerned kind of uh, uh, attitudes that it had back when it got in trouble with the, the, the McCarthy folks uh, back in the 1950s. So there's this period of, um, of neutrality and then a sort of slow move back uh, to getting involved with social issues. Well, let's move on now to the, 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 next, uh, the next lecture and consider what happens to rockabilly during this period and consider these rockabilly popsters. <laughs> 